Good morning. We'd like to welcome visitors to our worship service and ask that you fill out the communication card located at the back of the pew in front of you. If you could also sign the guest book in the front entrance to the church, it would be appreciated. We welcome saxophone player Brandis Hagsma and organist Henry Baker this week. And I would also like to call attention to some of the time-sensitive announcements in the bulletin. The new Members Inquirers class is beginning today after the service. We'll be meeting in the church office and if you would like to attend. May 18th will be church cleanup. May is also stewardship month and that announcements and updates will be forthcoming over the course of the month. Anyone interested in participating or who might have questions can see Austin Reichert. Today we invite Brandy Hagsma up for a minute for mission. Brandis has been a member of St. Patrick's Church for 27 years. She and her saxophone have also regularly been part of her piece of music program for several years. She has loved to serve others in her community since she was young. She went on a few missions here in the States during high school, but has never been out of the country. She is going to speak to us briefly about her upcoming trip to Haiti in June. Brandis? Good morning, everybody. That was really good. <laughs> um, okay, so as you said, I will be traveling to Haiti, and I think most of you already probably know that because I kind of say it all the time, like, guys, I'm going to Haiti. I'm so excited. Um, I would be lying to you if I said that I am not nervous because there's a lot of um, nervous parts to going, traveling in general and more out of the country. Um, be Like Brit is the foundation that we will be, um, that's organizing our trip. Um, there's 12 of us going, and um, we're basically going there for a week. Um, we go June 16th through the 22nd. Um, we're going there to build a very simple structure house for a local family in Haiti. Um, no electricity, no plumbing, um, but hurricane proof and just safe for the family rather than being in just a, a shelter or a tent. Um, there's an orphanage where I'll be staying. Um, they host 66 children um, that are non-adoptable, but they are there and they are always very happy to um, see visitors um, from Be Like Brit. Um, so if you guys want to speak to me um, after the service, I'm more than welcome to answer any questions or if you want to learn more about it, um, please come talk to me. Um, all the donations that I raise um, help to um, fund the building materials for the structure that we're building and um, to the orphanage for the children. Um, Brittany Gangle was a young girl that had traveled to Haiti back in 2010 um, and she sent out a text to her family three hours before the earthquake and said they love us so much and everyone is so happy. I want to move here and start an orphanage. Um, so her parents obviously you know, started this orphanage and um, just continued in her name. And, um, but anyway, please talk to me after the service and um, just continue to be in your prayers this week and on to into June. So thank you guys. Thank you. Now let us turn our hearts and minds to the worship of God. Let us join together in the call to worship. The Lord is my strength and shield. My heart trusts in him and I am helped. My heart leaps for joy and I will give thanks to him in song. The Lord is the strength of his people. Save. Um, disconnect here. Lord, it's a string. Uh, the save your people and bless your inheritance. Their shepherd and carry them for. Let us now do the call to confession. Scripture reminds us that if we say we have no sin, we deceive. Oh, I am so sorry. Let's do him. Um, How great thou art. Number four, verses one, three, and four.
Let us have our call to confession. Scripture reminds us that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us therefore go to God in confession, first together and then privately. Our Father in heaven, forgive us for thinking we see your plan clearly when we really see through a glass dimly. Forgive us especially when we fail to see that too often what we see as your plan is really just a reflection of our own plan. Help us to sit quietly and wait for you to reveal to us the plan you have us follow. Amen. Words of assurance. The psalmist tells us that the Lord's anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. God is always ready to forgive us when we genuinely confess, confess and repent our sin. In Christ we are forgiven, and as people who bear his name, we forgive others. In Christ, we are indeed a new creation. Thanks be to God. Let's now sing. The scripture reading for today, John 21, 1 through 10 and 12, can be found in your pew Bible, page 1, 1137. After Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, it happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana of Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we will go with you. So they went out and got into their boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they replied. He said, throw your net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard this, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing their net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, only about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have caught. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. All right, now it's time for the children's service, if the children would like to come forward. Good morning. How's everybody this morning? 
Everybody looks a little sleepy on this nice rainy day. It would have been a nice day to stay in bed late, wouldn't it? Yeah. Well, I have a question for you. Do you ever want to do something really, really badly? I mean, you just really want to do it so much. And mommy or daddy say, no, you can't do that. Does that ever happen? Can you think of anything that you really want to do? And mom or dad says, no, can't do that. Got something? All right, what you got? I can't really do it. My dad never lets me scoot in the rain when it's like today, when, but we had to go to church. Ah. So sometimes you have to go to church when that's not really what you want to do. Right. <laughs> yes. It would, it would have been nice to stay in bed this morning and slept in. Well, that happens to everybody, and that happens to grown ups too. In the Bible, there is a really famous story about a man named Saul. And he was just sure that he was going to do what God wanted him to do. He just knew that it was not right for all these people to be following Jesus. That was against the laws for the Jewish church. And it was just wrong, and he was going to see to it that they stopped doing it. Well, he was such a problem in Jerusalem that the people who wanted to follow Jesus left. And they went to another place far away, Damascus, Syria. Well, Paul said, you're not going to get away with it that, that easy. No siree. I'm going to go ask the priests in the temple, and they're going to give me orders to come and get you, and I'm going to come and get you, and you're going to come home and be punished. So that's what Saul did. And here, these people thought they could follow Jesus if they left Jerusalem. So Paul, Saul got his letters to the synagogues in Damascus, and off he went with some companions. And they were traveling down the road that went from Jerusalem to Damascus. And you know, Jesus wasn't quite so pleased with his idea. Saul might have thought it was great, but Jesus didn't think it was a very good idea at all. And so, to make him stop, as he got close to Damascus, Jesus stood out in front of Saul like a brilliant flash of white light. And he said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul says, who are you? And he says, I'm Jesus. I'm the one you're persecuting. And the light was so bright and the voice was so powerful that Paul Saul fell to the ground. I mean, face in dirt, kerplow. And then Jesus said, Now, you get up, and you go into Damascus, and you will be told what to do. And what do you suppose Saul did? What do you think he did? He got up and he went into Damascus and he waited to be told what to do. You know, I think that's what anybody would do if Jesus appeared to you like that brilliant flash of light and basically said, stop what you're doing. This is not what I want you to do. And you know what happened to Saul? Saul completely changed. Have any of you heard about the Apostle Paul? He was the one who went around the whole area and started little churches. He's really the one who wrote a lot of the books in our Bible. And he became one of the greatest spokesmen for Jesus of his time. He listened to Jesus. So sometimes when we really want to do something, 
and our parents say no, sometimes there's a good reason. And especially if we hear God saying, no, you shouldn't do that, you really got to listen to that. All right, let's come up and have a prayer together. Lots of sleepy people. Okay, ready? All right, you say after me. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, thank you for helping me know, thank you for helping me know what is right. What is right. And thank you for giving me parents. Thank you for giving me parents. Who help me do what is right. Who help me do what is right. Amen. Amen. Okay. You kids can go downstairs for Children's Church if you want to do that, or you can stay with your parents. You will find somebody back there in that corner, I think. I'm not seeing anybody back there. I'm going to hope there is someone. pray. Oh Lord, it's hard sometimes to hear what you would tell us. Help us to be willing to hear not only the sweet, warm, kind words, but also the words of correction when that's what we need. Speak to us the words that you know we need to hear. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. We continue looking at the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus this morning by taking a look at the experience Saul had as he was traveling from Jerusalem to Damascus. To say that the encounter was life-changing for Saul is kind of a ridiculous understatement for those of us who know the rest of the story, that Saul became the Apostle Paul after that encounter. We know very little about Saul. Scholars think that he was probably born around the same time, 
time frame that Jesus was born, but most of what we know about him comes from the 22nd chapter of Acts. Saul, who may have been named for King Saul, was born a Jew in the city of Tarsus in Silesia, but he grew up in Jerusalem. He was a student of the renowned and highly respected Gamaliel, who was a Pharisee and a doctor of Judaic law. Saul was both a Pharisee in the Jewish church and a Roman citizen. He described himself as zealous for God, and he showed that zeal by arresting Jewish men and women who were following Jesus, and even by killing some of them. Remember that at that time, Christianity was not a tradition of its own. People who followed Jesus were either believed to be an errant sect of Judaism, or they were just simply errant Jews who didn't know any better. They followed Jesus, believing that he really was the long-awaited Messiah. Given the presence of Pharisees such as Saul in Jerusalem, Jerusalem was not a very safe place for the followers of Jesus to live and worship. So many of them fled, and quite a number of them fled to Damascus, Syria, seeking asylum. Whenever someone went to the priests in the temple in Jerusalem and requested papers to show to the priests at the synagogue in Damascus, giving them the authority to arrest and bring back to Jerusalem the Jews who had sought asylum there, those Pharisees were given those papers. So Saul sought and was given papers to go and bring back any Jews he found in Damascus who were following the way, which is what it was called at that time. And he intended to bring them back to face punishment. His trip to Damascus was an extradition mission, and this would have been an especially important mission to a zealous Pharisee like Saul, because Damascus, Syria, was the hub of a commercial trade place that had far-flung trade routes all over the known world. There were trade routes to Syria, Mesopotamia, Persia, Anatolia, and Arabia. If this Christian sect flourished in Damascus, it could spawn a diaspora that would go all over the known world. So for Saul and the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem, this sect had to be stopped in Damascus, and it had to be stopped now. The sermon passage picks up when Saul and his traveling companions are on the way, and they're actually getting pretty close to Damascus. Acts 9, verses 1 through 9. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogue in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. 
Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. This is the word of the Lord. As Jesus' post-resurrection appearances go, this one is somewhat unique. In the first place, all of the appearances that he had made before had been to people who loved him, his beloved followers. Saul, on the other hand, could well have been among the Good Friday crowd who demanded that Jesus be crucified. In Jesus' other appearances, he had given peace, he had given assurance that he was alive, and he had given his followers the awareness that he would always be with them. In the case of Saul, Jesus' appearance was corrective. Saul was strong-willed and determined to stop the spread of the gospel. We don't necessarily get the idea that Jesus intended to punish Paul, Saul, but he did intend, intend to stop Saul from persecuting Jesus' followers and trying to stop the spread of the gospel message. If you have ever parented a child who is stubborn and strong-willed, you know how hard it is to stop that child from doing something he or she is determined to do no matter if there is danger in the doing. The I want what I want and I'm going to have or do what I want to do no matter what mentality closes the eyes and ears to anyone or anything that would obstruct the path to success. Children so determined and strong-willed can throw impressive tantrums when their way is blocked completely. Well, Saul was that strong-willed and determined as an adult. It took something powerful to stop Saul, and Jesus had and demonstrated the power to do exactly that. Jesus appeared to him as a brilliant flash of light and a loud voice that Saul simply could not ignore. Possibly for the first time in his life, Saul was confronted with a power that could stop him dead in his tracks and flatten him flat on his face. Such an experience is the most difficult way there is to find out that we are not the all-important, all-powerful people that we like to think we are, or that we are all-knowing of what is right. Jesus has a way of putting us in our place like no human being has. As we think of ways that we experience Jesus in our personal lives, we tend to think of the more benign ways. We think of the warm, loving closeness to Jesus that we feel when we are deep in prayer. We think of the peace that passes understanding when we are struggling to cope with times of tragic grief, alarming diagnoses of health problems, 
our own or our loved ones. And wanting that light to guide us as we seek to respond to God's call to particular missions and ministries. But let us not forget that we are human beings and we are subject to the vagaries of human sin. We can quite easily succumb to personal desires and plans that run counter to God's desire and plan. And we can be just as strong-willed as Saul was. God has a variety of ways to say, no, stop. Sometimes it's a profound experience like Saul had. Sometimes God just simply closes a door that we had wanted to walk through. We can pitch a temper tantrum and get angry at God but the door remains closed nonetheless. A far better reaction to a corrective encounter with Jesus is the one that Saul finally gave. Those of you who are in or have been in the military will recognize this supreme of all good responses. Yes, sir. Hindsight will doubtless show that God's plan really was more beneficial to ourselves and others than the plan that we had devised. Such was certainly the case for Saul. The willingness to heed and follow God's plan, though, is not an inborn characteristic of human beings. Human beings tend to be more rebellious. God's willingness to follow God's plan results only from that inner cleansing by the Holy Spirit that gives us a new life. Several years ago, the Gaithers popularized a song that illustrates the all too common human tendency to have and do whatever we want and to go wherever we want regardless of what God has in mind. The lyrics go like this. In the midst of World War II, with tensions running high off the eastern seaboard, one dark and foggy night, a captain sighted out ahead just off the starboard side, the beacon of another ship. The two would soon collide. Adjust your course 10 degrees to the north, he radioed ahead. And much to his amazement, the ship radioed back, adjust your course 10 degrees to the south. The captain felt a chill. His eyes grew cold and narrow, and the two grew closer still. I'm the captain of this vessel, and this is a command. Adjust your course 10 degrees to the north, or receive a reprimand. Again, the voice replying, was as calm and smooth as glass. Adjust your course 10 degrees to the south. I am a seaman, second class. I'm a U.S. naval destroyer, snapped the captain with a shout. Now adjust the course 10 degrees, no discussion over and out. They drew unnervingly closer, his eyes fixed on the light. This time, the voice ripped through the air like lightning tears the night. I am the lighthouse. I am the lighthouse. The path you choose is perilous. 
destruction lies ahead if you delay. But if you'll trust me, I will lead you through safely. Adjust your course and you'll be on your way. I am the lighthouse. Fictional or true, I have no idea. But I do know human nature. And I know there are times when we must be told no, even though that's not what we want to hear. And I know that from personal experience. I certainly am well experienced in trying to say no to God. I'm going to stay right where I am, thank you very much. It doesn't work. If it did, I'd still be in Atlanta helping people with learning disabilities instead of standing here. The lesson we can learn from Saul's experience on the Damascus Road is that we need to be more agreeable and willing to listen to God's plan, even if it leads us into circumstances and missions we would really rather not cope with. God has a plan, and it is a plan for good. God has a plan, and it is not just a plan for what we do. It is a plan for what we become, and it is a good plan. Following that plan, we have eternal life, now and forever. Amen. Let us stand and say what we believe using a couple of sections from the Confession of 1967. God's sovereign love is a mystery beyond the reach of man's mind. Human thought ascribes to God superlatives of power, wisdom, and goodness. But God reveals his love in Jesus Christ by showing power in the form of a servant, wisdom in the folly of the cross, and goodness in receiving sinful men. The power of God's love in Christ to transform the world discloses that the Redeemer is the Lord and Creator who made all things to serve the purpose of His love. Our next hymn is number 202, Amazing Grace. We're doing verses 1 through 4.
tithes and offerings. I experience God every day. Um, more recently, I experienced him in the sudden, sudden death and passing of my father. Um, which happened a month, a month ago in March. Um, it stopped me just like Saul did in the road to Damascus. While I was in the hospital with him, I asked the pastor who was with me, um, is it normal or unusual to feel peaceful? And they said yes. Um, and a friend of mine asked me, what was my relationship with God at the time? And I said I was very angry and very sad. And I still am, but I know that God is always with me. so much we have lost as we look down the road where all the prodigals have walked and one by one the enemy has whispered lies and led them off as slaves You are God, yours is the victory. We know there is more to come that we may not yet see. So with the faith you've given us, we step into the valley unafraid. We call out to dry bones, come alive, come alive. And we call out to dead hearts, come alive, come alive. Up out of the ashes, let us see an army rise. We call out to dry bones, come alive. God of endless mercy, God of unrelenting love, rescue every daughter, bring us back the wayward sons, and by your Spirit breathe upon them, show the world that you alone can save, you alone can save. So we call out to dry bones come alive come alive we call out to dead hearts come alive come alive up out of the ashes let us see an army rise we call out to dry bones come alive So breathe, O breath of God, now breathe, O breath of God, breathe, O breath of God, now breathe. Breathe, O breath of God, now breathe, O breath of God, breathe, O breath of God, now breathe. Sing with us, breathe, O breath of God. Breathe, O breath of God, now breathe, O breath of God. Breathe, O breath of God, now breathe. One more time, breathe, O breath of God. Breathe, O breath of God, now breathe, O breath of God. Breathe, O breath of God, now breathe. And we call 
out to dry bones, come alive, come alive. We call out to dead hearts, come alive, come alive. Up out of the ashes, let us see an army rise. We call out to dry bones, come alive. We call out to dry bones, come alive. God, take of the offerings that we have given, our financial offerings, our offering of time, and our offering of talent. Use them all for the coming of your kingdom. In Christ we pray. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, we will sing two verses of hymn number 325, and I would ask the elders and deacons who are serving communion to come forward. seated and let us pray oh Lord we do come to this table knowing that here in your presence at the feast that you prepare for us is truly all we need this is our life it is the life that keeps us going in this world and the next we come to this table with many needs, many joys, many griefs. We come to this table with many prayers, prayers for help, prayers of praise. Lord, we each bring our own here now from the depths of our heart, the prayers that we need to say to you in your presence.
Lord, as we pray for the needs of our hearts known only to you and to us, we also recognize that there are prayers that we would pray together for our life together. We pray your blessings upon this church, this community of faith that seeks to heed your call. These members of your body who seek to hear your truth, who seek to follow in the way that you call us to go. Hear these prayers of supplication for our church. Lord, we know that we exist in a community, a community with a lot of needs, a community with a lot of joys to celebrate, a community where there are people who know you and serve you daily, as well as people who don't know you at all. As we seek to minister to our community, you know each and every person in it Help us listen to your guidance for how we might minister to those who need to hear and feel your message of reconciling love. And now, Lord, bless us around this table that our spirits may be nourished, that our souls may feel and hear and heed your call. In the name of him who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is the Lord's table. It is not a Presbyterian table. It is a table that our Lord has prepared. And all those who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ are invited to participate in and partake of this feast. We know that on the night before our Lord was betrayed and arrested, he took bread at a meal with his disciples. And after giving thanks to God, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In like manner, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the remission of of sin. Whenever you drink this cup, do so in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we show forth the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again.
Let us drink together the cup of salvation. Let us join together in the unison prayer. Risen Lord, we have shared this bread and this cup and are united as a body of believers by the flesh and blood of your sacrifice for us. Give us eyes to see ourselves and each other as new people in Christ and give us hearts to love each other as you love us. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. Our closing hymn is, To God Be the Glory. mercy of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit goes with you now and forever. Amen.